Hello. Today we're going to talk about a slightly different subject that we haven't really covered before, and that is how we release starting signals entering single lines. I know I've covered staff, token and tablets before, but we didn't really cover the circuits that release the starting signal itself. And here at Church Lane we have three examples. We have absolute block, we have starting signals entering the absolute block section, which we'll look at. We have the traditional staff key. Most heritage railways have various variations on this, whether that be a fortress key or a unique key, which we'll have a look at next. We also have the token machine circuits, which we'll cover last of all. And we'll just basically look at a few of the basic things. So to start with, something we have to understand. We're entering a single line section and we have our starting signal. That starting signal, traditionally, if we clear it, we only be able to clear it once. So for every time we want to clear that starting signal, we want to make sure that the single line section is clear. And in the most basic form, we issue the driver with a staff or a token key or a, a tablet. When we release that tablet, token or staff, it wants to give us one release on the starting signal. Now, here at Church Lane, number 14 is our starting signal going towards Rosalie. It can be released normally off the token over there. We do have a degraded method that allows us to use the original system, the staff key here. But we want to be able to show that once we have that staff key, that there's nothing else in the section. Now, traditionally, the signalman having the staff key in their hand proves that the train has left the section. We only have one staff key, and that staff key has to be back with the signalman. Here at Darling, at Church Lane, when we wish to release that starting signal, under the old system, we would put the staff key in and turn, and that would give us one release on our starting signal. It would operate a relay we call the memory relay. For the purpose of this video, I'll just keep saying memory relay or the key stick relay. And the purpose of that is once we have a release, we want to be able to keep that release for as long as possible. Bear in mind, we might clear this signal 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, two months later, we're doing other things as a signaler. So once we've got the release, the relay wants to memorise that we had that release. Secondly, that release is only effective as long as we have not cleared the signal. So as I said, off we go, we're going to do other things. Here at Church Lane we have a level crossing. We've got to close a level crossing. It might take five minutes to do that and come back upstairs. We cleared this uh, starting circuit. Our memory relay remembered that five minutes ago. Now we finally want to clear our signal. So we go and clear our signal. Second we clear our signal, it breaks that memory circuit. So once again, that release is gone. That release is destroyed. Now there's two things to remember about starting circuits. There are starting circuits for home signals, starting circuits for our starting signals. There's a slightly different one for distant signals. And I'll mention this now while I've got the chance. There is something called one line clear one train, one line clear one pull. Big difference, one line clear one train, home and starting signals. You only want to be able to clear them once. That's it, you don't get a second release. If you've given the driver the key and they've entered the section, that's it, you will not get another release until that train is clear of that section and giving you the key back. But with distance signals, there's a slight problem. When we clear a distance signal, giving the distance of it's away, there's no guarantee it's gonna give a good off. So we might want to put that back and adjust it Try it again, I'm still not quite happy with it. Put it back, adjust it again, and pull it off several times. Now obviously, if we only have one release of that signal, we can't keep taking it off and putting it back. So the slight difference in that circuit is a track indication, a track relay. And what happens, once the train hits the approach track to that signal, it locks it. And it locks it in whatever position it is. If it's off, it's off. If the signal's on, it's on. It's so that the driver doesn't see us adjusting the distance signal and pulling it on and off and on and off in front of his face. What's happening here? Has that been put back to danger or is it just it's a cold day and the signal is adjusting it? I don't know. So that's the difference between one line clear, one train, one line clear, one pull. Starting signals, home signals, one line clear, one, tra uh, one pull. Distance signals, one line clear, one train. You can keep pulling it as many times as you want to get it adjusted until that train approaches it. That's an important difference. A couple of things we need to remember about starting signals, and you'll see these in the circuits that I'm going into next. Firstly, the starting signal itself. Traditionally, a white band on it, 
telling you it's released by something. So either key, staff, block, token, whatever. That tells the signal it's released or something. Something else to understand here on this frame, we have economizers behind here. So we don't have to have our hand on the button and our hand on the starting signal to pull it. That becomes a two-handed affair. You'll notice there are some push buttons. We'll get into that in a minute. If you are having starting signal circuits, you will notice in the diagrams that I show next, there is a lever band marked NA or NB on it. Now, for those who don't know, traditional lever at normal, we'll call that position N. The lever at reverse, we'll call that position R. C in the centre, and we'll work our way through the alphabet, so we'll go N, normal, to position A, to position B, C for the centre, D, E, R for reverse. To start off with, we need to prove that our starting signal was last put back to danger. We can't leave this signal off all the time, and that's important. So when we put our starting signal back to danger, it will prove that it's in the normal position. However, when we are clearing the lock, the electric lock, to allow us to pull this signal off, we have a problem. We cannot just have the contact proving the lever normal, because the second we try and move the lever, I'll give you an example with this out of use white lever here, it's in the normal at the moment. The second we try and clear it out normal, that would have broken that contact. And it would have broken the contact and dropped the electric lock and locked the lever up before it even got the lever out of the normal. So in the diagrams, you will notice there's an NB contact or an NA contact that's made between the normal and the A or B position. So in other words, the lever is just past the electric lock, the point at which the electric lock holds it. Because by then, when the lock breaks to say you've had your one pull of your starting signal, you can now still clear the signal. It's not jammed by the lock. Otherwise, what you would get is, clear it, it would jam. Get another release, clear it, it would jam. And this will go on and on. That's why you will see in the diagrams the NB contact. And we'll get into that next. One other thing to mention, as I mentioned, this proves that the lever is normal to start with. On the staff key, you will notice two things. Firstly, the key is unique. So in other words, you can't have hundreds of copies of this. That would defeat the object of having you know, the one staff that is applicable to that section of the line. And I'll show you why I staff in a minute. The other thing is that the key cannot be taken out permanently in reverse. So in other words, I can't turn this to release, to release my starting signal, and leave it in that position and take the key out. I'd have release all the time. That, that would, once again, make the circuit inoperative. So the key, once it's turned to release, has to be turned back to normal to get the key out. Now, traditionally, what they used to use back in the early 1970s, 1960s, on a lot of these circuits, was car keys, um, car ignition keys, perfect for the job. You can't get the key out in the reverse, but you have to turn it back to normal to get it out. So it gives you that one release. Um, I've also seen versions of this circuit with RS key switches, getting a little bit harder to get hold of now. We call them unique keys because each one's different. Um, there are standard ones, but this is a unique one. And also you will see fortress keys. And fortress keys that we use up at Darleydale, they're a little bit different. They're a laser cut key with some lettering inside. And the lettering inside is indented. Now indent matches the lettering on the key, on the, the switch itself. So you can't get the wrong key on the wrong one. You will see them traditionally in factories for interlocking between the, the various machines in factories if you want to isolate them and go and work on them. So there are various different types of keys around for this circuit. Now, the other thing to mention is blocks, and that's slightly different. Now here is our staff key, as I mentioned, and you'll notice two things. This is our unique staff key, our annex key. This releases the ground frames in the section, in the single line. That's a physical key, and on the end of it, we have our electrical release key, our unique key. Now, as you can appreciate, these keys over time do get a lot of bend and wear, so your drives need to be careful, they need to be in a pouch. Now, this is our degraded method key at the moment. We use our token machine in place of this, and we have a, a small uh, system for putting degraded methods into use, but as you can appreciate, a unique key, which is only one off, and this is then issued to the driver, and that forms the staff. 
So here we are on our staff key circuit. And as we can appreciate here, we have an indicator that tells us whether our signal is locked or free. I have the staff key in my hand. So what I'm going to do is insert it into the release key and turn it to reverse. You'll notice it now shows free. You can just see there. Now I can't get the key out in that position, so I have to turn it back to normal. I can now issue this to the train driver. And of course, once the train driver's gone, I cannot get another release because I haven't got the key. So, ready? Time to release the lock, push button and lever. I clear it, and if you're watching, the free will drop just about there, by which time I've got my lever clear of my electric lock. I can now focus with both my hands and everything I'm doing upon pulling the signal off. And that's why I said you need the NANB band, so it doesn't just keep catching the lock there. Now, of course, I've given the staff key to the driver and off he's gone. So I only have one release of this signal. When I put this back, I do not get a second release until that train is clear of the single line and has given me my staff key back. And I put that key back into the release circuit. Now, I know this looks complicated, but bear in mind, as I mentioned, we have a degraded method of operation for being able to swap over from the token back to the original staff key. So in this circuit, we're looking at the staff key all we're going to concentrate on is this path here, which is our key turned to the reverse or release position, which picks a line clear stick relay. Remember the memory relay goes off to the negative. And then once that relay is energized, of course, remember we take our key back out again. So that breaks that path, but this relay stays memorized. It stays energized because down here we have a contact of our own relay. So once that relay is energized, this line clear stick relay stays st stuck up over its own contact and holds itself up until we break our starting signal contact. Remember the NA, NA, NB band? So having broken our signal by pulling it off, we then can't get this relay back up again because this path is destroyed. We don't have our starting signal back at normal again and we certainly don't have our key back. So then to get it restroked again, to get that memory relay back up again, we have to have the key back and we also have to have our starting signal back as well. So those are the two basic things in the staff key circuit. Onto this, we have a token circuit as well. So we have an ability to use a token, um, token circuit. Now, one thing to note about the token circuit, I won't go too much into it. Traditionally, token relays are a low uh, current relay so there's a 2 ohm and a 250 ohm path the 2 ohm path sits there in with a load of other resistances and, and doesn't take much current to get it to energize however once it's energized traditionally this path will be bypassed in the machine and you'll get the full battery current and battery voltage across it and that would damage the relay hence the 250 ohm path now here we don't have a key token stick relay um, they're quite hard to get hold of. So what we've effectively done is used a very low current relay, a track relay, and used a wire wound resistance to effectively add to the 250 ohm path. So we have a, uh, instead of the 2 ohm, 250 ohm path, we have a 9 ohm, 250 ohm path. And that's how we work it. But this is a mirror image of this key, uh, staff key circuit here. So there's some variations in it. Also, what we have here, we have the circuits cut out by a, a release switch. So before you can switch over from the token to the staff key circuit integrated methods, you have to isolate the token circuit and go through a process of certain releases. And I'll get into that last thing just to show you how that works. Um, that was just allowing us to be able to not have to call the S&T technician out for a 60 mile round trip. They may be away on holiday. There may not be anyone there. Traditionally, we run one train. So it's one train in, one train out. So rather than have to call an S&T technician out, the signal can go through a process of going back into a degraded method of working um, until such time as the S&T can get there and it allows trains to carry on running. Now block circuits are slightly different and I appreciate not everybody will understand the basics of the block circuit so I'll just give you a quick refresher now. This is our standard block, our BR standard block, penguins as some people call them because of the black and white. The white section is from the signal box at the other end, the signal box that is giving us the release. Everything down here, the black bit, is what we control, giving him a release. And this is traditionally for a double section of line. So he will let us in, so to speak, from one direction, and we will let him in from the other. 
You'll notice this bit, and this is a bit I'm going, going, going to get into. This is our pegger, our pegger indication, and our pegger. And our pegger can sit in one of three positions. The normal in the middle, nothing's happening. The key relay in our block controls path is the VCR. And again, this takes the incoming feed, uh, it's a polar relay, from the other signal box. So if the other signal box pegs a train on line, the polar relay will move one direction. If it pegs a line clear, the polarity will be the other way around, and that will drive the contact over the other way. Again, if the system fails and the power completely falls off, again, it will fall back to its automatic safe position. So the only time you will ever get the contact made the correct way that you want is if you have a line clear. So as you saw in the path in the diagrams, there will be a train on line side and a line clear side to this release relay. And we have to first, as I mentioned, go through the train being proved last exited the section by us agreeing to that with the interlocking by pegging train on line. And then that will pick part of the circuit and then when we get the line clear, we'll pick the other circuit. And we'll show you that in the diagrams as well. Regarding the block circuit, I'm going to use this simplified LMS drawing. And this is our path at the top here that goes through our BCR relay. This is the polarised path coming from the other signal box. Now to start with, we'll notice we have our lever contact, our NAMB contact of our starting signal, must be it normal. We try and go across, we reach this BS relay, and we can't get through the BS relay, it's down to start with. So the first thing we have to do is go down here. Here's our BCR relay. Now we have two contacts. This contact is made when the BCR relay is in the train line position, and this contact is made when the BCR is in the line clear position. So to start with, our starting signal on, and we must have last pegged train on line, proving the last train's gone out of the section. Can't get this way, because that's the line clear side. We can go back up, and it then goes to the BS relay, which energizes and goes off to the negative. This is a memory relay, it's a stick relay. As soon as the BS relay makes, it makes this contact here. So now, of course, when we peg a, a line clear, when we get line clear from the other signal box, on this path up here, this line clear here makes, and of course, the train line breaks, but we have our BS relay now up, it's memorized itself. And our feed can then go down and keep the, pick the lever lock then. Again, going back to the negative. So then we have our release and our starting signal. As soon as we pull our starting signal off, we lose our lever band. That breaks and the whole system has to be reset again. We have to put our starting signal back. We have to cancel again through train on line, which breaks the line clear path and the whole circuit starts again.